Good morning, everybody. It is awesome to be with you this morning. Uh, I know this is a very unusual way to be gathering, uh, but we are still the church, and it's still good to gather uh, together. Uh, we are live on Facebook. It is March 22nd, and you will get a replay on this on Facebook later on. And also, if uh, you know people that do not have Facebook and they would like to check out this service, then they can go to the um, Elgin Missionary Church website and click on sermons and they will get a replay there early in the week. Uh, this is not our preferred way to gather. I miss seeing your faces, shaking hands, uh, getting hugs. But uh, we know that uh, just in this day and age, we need to be uh, diligent uh, in following protocols so we can still be together. We can still support one another. So I have a few announcements that I would like to begin uh, sharing with you. Uh, a lot of you will have tuned in this morning expecting to, to hear Mike Weeb uh, bringing his second message. Things have changed up just a little bit since last Sunday and you will hear Mike next Sunday. So make sure you tune in next Sunday to hear the rest of Mike's message. We have a surprise speaker this morning. Josiah Rizzo is going to come and deliver a message for us, his first message to Elgin Church and uh, in this unusual format. But uh, we um, are going to hear from Josiah later. I'm looking forward to that. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea, sit back and let's enjoy worship together. So a few announcements that I want to share is that uh, you probably already know by now that we have cancelled all of our church services and programs until further notice. Um, we, um, for example, all Bible studies are cancelled, prayer meeting is cancelled, the seniors luncheon, the ladies day away, all kids programs are cancelled. Uh, however, there is one program that is continuing and that is Lighthouse, uh, our young adults program. They are continuing, uh, but they are meeting online. They are not meeting in person. So if you are a young adult and you are interested in being part of that group, you can email youth at elginmc.ca and uh, you will get details on how to be part of that, gr that group. Uh, also, some smaller teams and committees uh, are meeting online, uh, which is a great way to continue the work, uh, but not have to be actually physically together. I have also been sending out information through our church email. Uh, if you are not on the list and you would like to be on the list, then please email me directly uh, for updates on what's happening here at Elgin. And my email is Eva at elginmc.ca. Also, uh, in one of the emails that I sent out to you earlier in the week, it let you know about different options for donations. Uh, we also have our donation site back on the website. Uh, it had been down for a little bit, but it is back. So if you would like to donate online, you can go to elginmc.ca and click on donations and you can contribute that way as well if you choose to. You know, while we expect this to be temporary, uh, we're keen to get back together again, uh, shutdowns like this do not mean the church should stop being the body of Christ. Even when we can't meet in person, in our normal building, we need to stay in contact and encourage one another through text messages, phone calls, FaceTime, Skype, or whatever platform you want to use. In just a few short weeks, the classification of the coronavirus, COVID-19, escalated from outbreak to epidemic to global pandemic. And now we are in a declared state of emergency. There is not a person watching this that has not been impacted by the coronavirus in one way or another. And right now, many people are anxious. Some have even gone to the extreme, bunkering down and panic purchasing 
toilet paper, of all things, and preparation for the end of the world. When the rest of the world panics, how can Christians still bring the life and love of Jesus Christ to a sick and dying world? I read an article recently by Joel Ryan outlining several areas that we can be the church, and I'm going to share just a few of them with you. Number one, do not surrender to fear. While the world lives in fear, we look to the peace and the power of God, and we trust in his promises like Isaiah 41 verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Number two, let's be the church. We have a tremendous opportunity to be the salt and light of the world, as it says in Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Imagine what the next few months could look like if the church took the lead on giving, compassion, and community care. Global disaster or opportunity? We get to decide. There are many ways to react to a public health crisis like coronavirus, but we have the power to do more than react. Now is the time for Christ followers to truly go on the offensive and unleash the power of prayer for healing, for strength, for provision, for peace, for, for wisdom, and for unity. We serve a God who is bigger and stronger than any sickness, fear, or darkness, or any weapon of the enemy. So trust in the Lord. Be the church to a sick and frightened world. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Okay, I'm not the preacher this morning, so I'm going to stop there. I have something that I want to share with the kids. So, while I'm praying, I'm going to pray in a moment. While I'm praying, uh, why don't you call your kids if they're not gathered around the screen. Call your kids to come to the screen. To get them uh, a piece of paper and a pencil. And we're going to do something together. Uh, so, while your kids are coming, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, what an amazing God you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. Thank you, Lord, that even though we cannot gather as a church, you were with each individual family as they watch online. And we are together online. Thank you, dear Lord, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Thank you, God, that you are in control that we do not have to fear, that we can trust you in the midst of the chaos that's going on around us. Thank you, Lord, that when we accepted you as Lord and Savior, you came into our lives, and with that, the Holy Spirit came and filled us with the fruits of the Spirit. Help us to exercise those fruits, Lord, and may they rise up joy and peace and love. And may we show to our community that we are the church and that we are here for them. Help us to connect with one another. Help us to encourage one another and bless one another. We thank you for who you are and you are with us in the midst of all things and you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids, I hope you're all out there watching. I've got something just for you. And... If you've got a piece of paper and a pencil, what I want you to do is put your hand on the paper, okay, and draw around your fingers. Okay, is everybody doing that? So draw around your fingers, and you should end up with something like this, okay? Now, did you know that every one of your fingers has a name. 
Maybe you did know that, maybe you didn't, but every finger has a name. Now, the first one you probably know. It's this one here, okay? So, I want everybody to shout out the name of this uh, all together uh, after I count three, okay? So, tell me what this is after three. I want to be able to hear it here at the church, so shout it really loud, okay? So, after three. One, two, three. Okay, I think I might have heard some of you, but I don't think everybody called out that this is the thumb. So, this is your thumb, and thumb starts with T, and T is for thanks. So, we want to give thanks to God for the things that he has given us. Now, this is something that we do often on church on a Sunday morning when we're all together, right? We say, thank you, God, for... And I know many of you say, thank you, God, for flowers. Thank you for family, for parents. Thank you for our friends. And that's great. So continue to do that. So your thumb is for thanks. Now, do you know what this finger is? Maddie, why don't you come up and help me here? Let's see if Maddie knows this finger. Maddie, do you know what this finger is called? I think... It's the pointer finger. You are right. And it's called the pointer finger because you point at things, right? Like Maddie's hair, right? It's pretty. Okay, so the pointer finger starts with P. And P is for praise. So, Maddie, what kind of things can we praise God for? That it's finally sunny outside. Yay. <laughs> That's really good. We can praise God for all kinds of things. Uh, okay, now this one might be a tough one. It's your biggest finger. It's the tallest one. Now, I wonder how many people know the name of this finger. Do you know, Maddie? The middle finger? Uh, good guess. That's a really good guess. In the middle. It's in the middle. You are right. And it's the tallest finger, but it's got a special name. It's called the index finger. Oh, right. right. Now you remember. Okay, yeah. so this is the index finger. An index starts with the letter I. And I is for I'm sorry. So think of things that you might be sorry for. Maybe dad asked you to do something and you didn't listen. Maybe mom wanted you to tidy up your clothes and you didn't do that. Or maybe you were mean to a sibling and you really didn't mean to be, but you know, you just need to say you're sorry, but say sorry to God as well. Just say, God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. Will you help me to do better? Okay, so we've got thanks and praise and I'm sorry. And then this one has a special name. Now, this is a clue. Okay, Maddie, what's this finger called? The ring finger. That's right, because this is the finger we normally wear our rings on. So, the ring finger begins with R, and R is for request. So, this is when we make our request to God. So, request is just asking God for something. So, maybe there's something you want to ask God for. Maybe you want just some space to be alone because you've been together as a family so much recently. You just want to have some space to get away and just be by yourself. So you can say, God, would you help me get some time to be alone and just, just to get my head straightened out and just to think about you maybe or just, just to unwind and to de-stress. De okay, now I I bet everybody knows this one. Do you think so, Maddie? Do you think Probably. everybody knows this one? What is this one? The pinky finger. That's right. It's the pinky finger. It's our smallest finger. And it begins with P. And P is for protection. So we can pray to God for protection for ourselves, for our families, for the people that we love, for our community, and for our world. We can pray for protection for all kinds of things. So, we had thanks, praise, I'm sorry, request, and protection. Okay, so thank you, Maddie. I appreciate your help. And 
I'm going to pray with you now, and then when I'm done praying, Josiah is going to come and bring the message. Okay, so I am going to pray each of these things. Okay, so here we go. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. You are an amazing God, and we love you. We praise you, and we thank you that you are always here with us. Heavenly Father, we're sorry for the things that we have done wrong this week. We ask that you would forgive us. We pray, Lord, you would forgive us for our attitudes. You would forgive us for maybe not trusting you. Uh, but we commit all that to you and we pray that you would take it and that you would help us to trust you more. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help each one of us uh, in the midst of these unusual things that are happening with school closed, family being together all the time. We pray that you would help us to find things, uh, help the kids to find things, to keep them busy, that they'll not be bored. Uh, I pray that the adults will take the opportunity to read your word, uh, to listen to sermons online and podcasts, and to continue to grow in you. And Father, we pray for your protection. We pray that you would guard us, that you would put a hedge of protection around each one of us in the midst of this crisis. We know that some people are getting sick and we pray that you would just protect uh, people, more people from getting sick and that you would uh, just help us to trust in you and uh, just give everything to you and not be worried or concerned. Thank you, God, for who you are. You are amazing, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to introduce or welcome Josiah. All right. Thanks, Eva. All right, so my name is Josiah Rizzo. I'm the youth pastor, or co-youth pastor here at uh, Algon Missionary Church. So, uh, like Eva said, Mike was supposed to preach this week, and I was scheduled for the week after that. But last week, uh, before the service started, I was letting Mike know some of the ideas that I thought God had put on my heart to speak to the church, and they lined up perfectly with what he was, he was uh, talking about. So, uh, we, we discussed and, and thought my, my message fit in better this week, and he's going to speak uh, next week. Uh, so here's a bit of a, a warning. You might not like this message. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to hear, but I, I prayed a lot over this, and this is what I feel like God wants to say through me. So let's pray. God, I want to speak your words this morning, not my own. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. I pray for everyone who's listening. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be working in their lives. And God, that you would be revealing to them truth. God, I thank you that your word is alive and is breathing. And so, yeah, you want to say something to your people. Pray that we would be receptive of that message. In your name, amen. So I don't like being lied to. I don't think anyone does. However, we've all been told a huge lie. And all of us have fallen victim to it to some capacity. This lie is driven into us by society, by media, even in Christian circles, and the people around us. What is this lie? That life is all about you. Now, they don't come out right and say it like this, but this message is still being portrayed. Life is about your happiness, having everything that you want. They say, you do you. Do whatever makes you feel good. And we're being bombarded by every, on every side by messages telling us to live it up in this world. You only live once, and so do whatever you want. Now you might be saying, okay, Josiah, 
but that's influencing other people, not me. So how does this mindset affect us as Christians? How many times have we come away from a worship session or service and say, you know what, I didn't really like the worship today. They only did hymns, or they only did choruses. I didn't like the service today. They didn't do things the way that I wanted them to. I'm too busy to serve other people, but I'm not too busy to watch a TV show or binge a, a show on Netflix. I only like spending time with fun people that I like. And I'll just ignore the other people who are hard to be around. And how much time have you spent on social media this week compared to how much you've prayed? We'd be foolish to think that we're immune from the influence of the culture around us. Because we are influenced by this, it's all about me mindset. When God asks us, asks us to do something that's hard, we hesitate and ask, is this really what God wants for me? Because I don't really want to give that up. Does he really expect me to go and share my faith with people? Isn't that the pastor's job? But if I share my faith with people and go out and befriend people, that means sacrificing my time, my resources, my comfort. He can't possibly be asking me to stop sitting in this area, can he? When we start making excuses, we convince ourselves that it's okay that we're not listening to God. We say, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And I'm guilty of falling to this trap too. I came up with these examples out of my own uh, convictions. We're all human, and our human uh, nature is to be selfish and to care about ourselves first. And Satan plays into this desire, and uh, it, he focuses all of our attention on ourselves. But this is a giant scheme by the enemy to make us lose sight of what's actually important. The truth is, life's not all about you. Know why? Because if life's all about you, then it's not all about God. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. Colossians 1.16 For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. The primary purpose for why you were made is to glorify God. The meaning of life that everyone is searching for, the Bible says that our meaning of life is to live in a way that brings glory to Jesus. And the Bible says that's the reason why you were created. So what does this look like? Let's look at some biblical examples. And we're going to get into the Bible specifically at some of the prophets. A prophet is someone who is in contact with a divine being and speaks on their behalf. And we see that God used people as his messengers. And he loved the prophets and valued them as people, but he used them for his purposes and not their own. God had a bigger game plan going on than just making sure that these prophets lived happy, easy, and safe lives. And the prophets weren't the most comfortable while they were here on earth. They said, I'll do whatever God calls me to do to bring him the most glory. And if that doesn't go along with my plans for my life, I'm going to change them to fit his plans. And people having this attitude towards God is present throughout the whole Bible. And I'm going to lead you through uh, examples of two prophets that had this understanding that life wasn't about them, and one who didn't. I'm going to give a brief overview of the lives of the prophets, and you can go back and read the full uh, book yourself later, and make sure that I'm not just making things up. So the per first prophet we're going to look at is Ezekiel. God chose Ezekiel as a prophet to share his message with the Israelites. After, after uh, Ezekiel encountered God, 
he fell face down. This was an act of submission and humility, recognizing just who was before him. He's saying, I'm, I'm just a human being, and you're the God who created everything. And, and right then, he surrendered all of his rights to God, and, and he does as he is told. And so God, having a willing servant, sends him on a mission. The first uh, part of this mission was that he was going to be speaking to a stubborn people who were not going to listen to his message. The message he, that God gave him one, was one of judgment and restoration. To, for God to make his point and, and illustrate what was going to happen to the Israelites, he told Israel to um, be confined to house arrest while being tied up with ropes and his tongue being tied. God told Ezekiel to lie down on his left side for 390 days. And then on top of that, he had to lie for an extra 40 days on his right side. God told Ezekiel to eat bread that was cooked over cow poop. He was told to shave his head and his beard. And he was even made a widower when his wife died and God said that he wasn't allowed to mourn for her. So Ezekiel 24, 24 says, Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. So even though it might not make sense to us why God told Ezekiel to do these things, um, he did it so that he could send a message through him to Israel. Ezekiel was to be an illustration so that the people would get what God was saying. And I'm sure Ezekiel didn't enjoy doing these things. Who would want to lie on their side for 390 days? It sounds like a huge inconvenience to me. If we take our modern mindset sometimes and put it on him, it's like, but, but God wants me to be comfortable in this life. I'm sure Ezekiel wasn't that comfortable when he was lying on his side. I'm sure he wanted to turn over and, and get some rest. But I think Ezekiel understood something that we lose sight of a lot of the time. His life wasn't about him. It was about glorifying God no matter what it takes and being obedient to him. Did God not love Ezekiel? Of course he did. But God still used him to accomplish his greater plan. The second example I have is Hosea. And Hosea is another example of how God used someone for his purposes. God told Ezekiel to go and marry a prostitute, Gomer. And this was to, to symbolize how Israel is acting like a prostitute by turning against God and worshipping idols. God even told them to join his body with a prostitute. And I'm sure Hosea wasn't happy with this situation, but he submitted to God and did it anyway. Now, even after Gomer was married to, uh, to Hosea, she still continued with her prostitution and got pregnant because of it. And God told uh, Hosea to name some of the kids some really weird names. So the verse one was Loruhema, uh, which means not loved. And then the second son, he was told to name Lomi, which means not my people. I'm sure that would have sucked for the children. I mean, I'm sure they got made fun of it for, uh, by other kids. Like, hey, not loved. Like, and then later, um, when Gomer commits adultery against Hosea, God tells Hosea to go and love her again. And he goes and buys her back with his own money. And this is all for the illustration that God still loves Israel, even though his people have, have turned away from him. God was being used by God, or Hosea was being used by God uh, for him to send a message through Israel. Hosea was surrendered to God's will and did as he was told. 
So the third example is, uh, is Jonah. And if we're, if we're wondering what happens when people say, you know what, God, I don't want to listen to you. Yeah, I'm just going to go over here and do my own thing. Let's take a look at Jonah. Jonah was the only prophet in the Old Testament to reject and disobey God's instruction. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed down to Tarshish. Now this wasn't the easiest task that, that God was calling him to do. So Jonah was like, I know, I'll run away from God. And he openly rebels against his divine mission. He valued his own will above God's. And look what happened to him. Jonah was thrown out of the boat into a stormy sea and then was eaten by a big fish. And he stayed in his stomach for three days before he surrendered his will to God's. And as a side note, does God give up on us when we get it wrong and disobey? No, he doesn't. But he does point us back in the right direction, sometimes through drastic measures. Here's some other examples uh, quickly uh, in the Bible of examples of, of what people did for God. So Daniel was thrown into a lion's den because he prayed to God even though it was illegal. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship an idol and were thrown into a fiery furnace. You might say, but Josiah, those are all in the Old Testament. God doesn't do that stuff anymore. Yeah, because it gets way better in the New Testament. Almost all of the disciples were martyred for their faith. They believed in this message message so much that they gave up their lives for it. And even today, Christians are dying for their faith because God told them to share the gospel in countries where it's illegal. Now, all of these biblical characters, except the last one, um, had this understanding that life was bigger than just them. These aren't biblical characters, but they're Christians, so they're good. They had this understanding that, that life was, was bigger than just about them. They didn't let their own agendas get in the way. They knew they were just one piece in the puzzle that God was creating. Friends, this is what it means to be a Christian in the first place. Jesus said to a crowd that was following him, whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Now the cross back then wasn't this nice symbol of grace that we know now. It was a symbol of torture. Jesus was saying that if you want to become a Christian, you might die for your faith. And when you said, yes, I want to be a Christian, this, this is what you signed up for. What does this mean for us today? We need to repent of this idea that it's all about us and adopt the same attitude as these biblical characters that we looked at. And this, this attitude is submission of our rights to God. Church, life's not about us. And we have to repent and give up on this idea that we are the center of the universe. That church is about meeting our needs. Or that life is about us. And it's about our safety and our comfort. And guess what? It's actually better that life isn't about us. If we try to do things on our own, we just mess it up. Think about the times in your life where you went, and went, went against what God told you to do. And how that end up? Was it good for you? No. God tells us to do things because they're the best for us. Jesus said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. 
My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus promises that he's going to give us a satisfying life, but it may not be the way that we think. And it may not be by our standards, but by his. And just so you know that we're the weird ones with this mindset that, that things are about us. Um, there's Christians overseas right now who are being persecuted for their faith. They're being killed for sharing the gospel with people. They're being tortured, and yet they're still not denying their faith in Jesus. And they're looking over at us and saying, what do you mean you complained about what color the carpet is? Uh, who cares? There's bigger stuff going on here than, than just about what we want. When God brings you through a hard time, are you going to question him and rebel against him? Or are you going to say, I don't know what's going on right now, but I'm going to obey God and trust that he knows best. So re in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing that we're all going through, and, and this is the real applicable moment of this message, this is what you can do today. There's tons of people out there looking out for number one. They're buying lo loads of toilet paper and leaving some people with none. I'm sure some of you have seen the, the pictures on Facebook where there's um, some elderly people who weren't able to, to beat the crowd and are looking at empty shelves. If we're going to live in this submission to God, the, his second greatest commandment to us is love your neighbor as yourself. So how can we share the resources that God's given us with people in need? And I, I want to make a note that there's no shame for asking for help either. It takes humility to reach out and ask for someone's help to meet your needs. Uh, I have an example of this story. Um, last year, almost, um, to, to right this day, um, our apartment flooded. Um, and we, we were homeless. And um, me thinking, oh, I have to figure this out on my own. I have to be a good provider for my family. I, I went in and rented an Airbnb, and we stayed in there for a few days, and, but it was getting expensive. And so I'm looking uh, around, looking online for all these different options of where we can stay. And then, I don't know why I didn't think about this b before, but I suddenly thought, wait, what, why not throw this out to the church? Um, and so I contacted the pastor and he sent an email out to the, the church that we were attending and like four people got back to us and said, yeah, we have an extra room in our house. Come stay with us. We will feed you. Um, we'll help you, uh, yeah, give you a place to stay while you figure out where you're going. And yeah, God taught me a huge lesson through that, that it's okay to ask for help. And that's actually the purpose of the church is to help meet uh, people's needs. And so if you need something, please ask, please reach out to, to uh, other members of the church or, or other people. Uh, it gives someone else the chance to obey God and to bless you. So 1 Peter is a letter written to the church in the middle of a social crisis. The people are going through a season of terrible testing involving persecution, suffering, and death. It says this, So be truly glad. Remember, they're, they're going through a crisis when, when he says this. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little, little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now that we're not able to meet and gather as a church and gather for all of our programs, this time could be a trial for your faith. And let's all take this time to self-reflect. How important is God really in your life? 
we're not able to gather, and so are you still committed to growing in your faith? If your faith is genuine, then the Bible says that this is a time when your faith will be purified and that you'll grow. And so let's take this time, church, to, to dive deep. We have a lot more free time now, and so we can fill it with entertainment and social media, or we can take, this, take advantage of this extra time. You can meet with God right in your house. God is right there, and he is, he's ready to spend time with you. And so we just have to get into the word. We have to, to spend time, take time to, to pray with him. Uh, we can do this as families. Uh, parents, you can lead your children and show that, yeah, this, this Christian thing isn't just about Sunday morning. Now that we're not able to meet, we can do this right in our house. And to conclude... I admit that there's still areas in, in my life where I'm still living for myself. I'm still trying desperately to keep this mindset all the time, and it's hard. Keeping this mindset requires constant submission to God and recognition of our place before him. But we can trust him with our lives. He knows what he's doing. True joy in this world comes from worshiping him with our lives. And one day we're going to be with him in heaven, and all of our hard work and sacrificing is going to be worth it. Let's pray. God, we confess that life isn't about us, and we confess that sometimes we've, we've become selfish. We try to make things about us. But God, I pray that you'll help us to, to submit to you. Help us to see that it's not about us and it's about you. And so help us to be uh, obedient to, to you in every area of our life. God, we, we recognize that, yeah, we, we suck at this sometimes. So we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit to convict us. Please help us with this in your name. I have a few more things to say. Um, so next week, Mike's going to be speaking about getting it right and what is having this attitude look like in our Christian lives. Since you can't shake hands and be friendly with one another, um, we're asking that you please contact three people from the congregation this week. Um, you can message them. You can email them. You can phone call or video chat. There's lots of options out there. Uh, we want to stay connected as a church and encourage each other in these rough times. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace.